And uh, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to all our members and guests joining from uh, across New Zealand and, and overseas today. Um, my name is Dan Stevens. I'm the uh, chair for the webinar this evening. Uh, I'm a uh, fellow of the Chartered Institution of Water and Environmental Management, um, SIWEM, and a committee member for the uh, SIWEM New Zealand branch uh, based in Christchurch. Um, so I know we've got a, a number of guests um, joining us today who aren't um, members of SIWEM, so welcome to you all. Um, for a little bit of background, um, if you're not really uh, aware of SIWEM, we're uh, based in the UK, but with um, branches in 89 countries and uh, over 10,000 members worldwide. Um, so an independent charity and the leading Royal Chartered professional body dedicated to sustainable management of the environment globally. Um, so if you want to find out more, you can have a look on the, the website, which is www.siwem.org. So uh, this afternoon, we're, it's a continuation of our webinar series where we're discussing uh, topics of interest to members and other industry professionals. And the subject of uh, tonight's webinar is the climate emergency. Uh, is New Zealand doing enough? Um, so that's a, a really topical um, subject at the moment um, and looking forward to, to having some really interesting presentations and conversations around that. Uh, before we get into today, I'd like to just uh, do a plug for the next webinar, which is on the 24th of August at um, four o'clock New Zealand time. And that's on the future of New Zealand small drinking water supplies and the implications uh, from, of water reform. And again, we've got a great lineup of speakers for that night, including uh, Jim Graham, who's the principal technical advisor with Tomato Arawai, the, the new drinking water regulator in New Zealand, and another number of other speakers. Um, so I think Jane will be putting up the, the link to that in, in the chat um, as we go. Uh, so a little bit of housekeeping um, for today. Um, None of the speakers are actually using PowerPoint slides this evening, so don't get too shocked when you don't see slides popping up. Um, we think it'll be far more engaging to, to talk without slides this evening. Uh, this is being recorded and it will be up on the uh, SIWEM website, um, and you can see a link there to go back and look at um, past presentations. The chat, um, if you just use the chat for putting any sort of general comments or technical issues that you're having, um, but put your questions in using the Q&A um, and don't be afraid to get those in as, as we listen to the speakers this evening. Um, I'll be sort of monitoring those as we go and, and looking for the, uh, the questions that got the most likes to, to help sort of prioritize as we get into the sort of panel session and the questions and answers later on. So. Please use the Q&A facility for anything that you, you want to, to ask um, to any of our speakers this evening. So today we've got uh, three great speakers um, with a, a wealth of knowledge between them. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Rob Carr. Uh, Dr. Rob Carr was appointed chair of Hapu Orangi Climate Change Commission in 2019. Prior to that, he spent 10 years as the vice chancellor of the University of Canterbury five years as Chief Executive at Jade Software Corporation, and in his time he served as the Deputy Governor, the Acting Governor, Non-Executive Director and Chairman of the Board of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. He also served as five years as the Founding Chair of the National Infrastructure Advisory Board, and for 10 years as a Director of the Canterbury Cham Employers Chamber of Commerce. He was a director of Hilton Port Company for 10 years and is currently a director of the crown entity Otakaro, which is overseeing a billion dollars of construction in the convention center and Metro Sports Center in Christchurch. So quite a, a resume there, but in his spare time, he's actually run 23 marathons, the most recent uh, in 2019 in North Korea and also inside the, the polar circle in Greenland. So where he finds the time, I'll never know. Um, but our first speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Rob Carr. Hello, everybody, and, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, I thought I would take uh, the opportunity of these comments to address a couple of matters. The first is the question of the day. Is New Zealand doing enough? And by that, we mean, is New Zealand doing enough 
in the context of climate change and the climate emergency. The Climate Change Commission in its final report on New Zealand's initial emissions budget and an emissions reduction plan that would give effect to those budgets in providing advice to the government was clear. New Zealand is not doing enough and we are not on track to achieve our domestic targets and international obligations to reduce our contribution to the greenhouse gases which are causing global warming. We have statutory targets which have been set by Parliament and are in our legislation. As a quick reminder, those targets are that New Zealand is committed to reduce biogenic methane, both from agriculture and waste, by 10% from its 2017 levels by 2030 and by 24 to 47% from its 2017 levels by 2050, and by 2050 to be net zero in all long life gases. So the three domestic targets are clear. They have been set by parliament. And if you don't like the targets, then you should be addressing parliament with that concern. There are certain circumstances in which a review of those domestic targets can be initiated either by the commission or by the minister. At this point, the commission is of a view that those triggers for a review of those domestic targets have not been met. That is not to say that in the future they won't be. So the commission's initial piece of work was to say, Given those targets, are current policy settings on track to achieve those targets? And the conclusion the Commission reached was no. Rather than a 10% reduction in biogenic methane by 2030, we might get a 7% reduction. And rather than a 24 to 47% reduction in biogenic methane by 2050, we might get a 12% reduction with current policy and projections. And we also believe that by 2050, we will be planting an unsustainable additional amount of land in Pinus radiata or other fast growing exotics if we are to hold anything like near net zero in the decades in the second half of this century. So the conclusion was that we needed to provide emissions budgets, which were lower than the current policy settings and trajectories, and an emissions reduction plan consistent with the legislation that would give us a chance of achieving those budgets. And that was the work that was presented to the minister and tabled in parliament in June. The government must now consider what it will do, because it is the government, not the commission, that must set New Zealand's emissions budgets for the period to 2035, and must adopt New Zealand's first emissions reduction plan. And it must do that by the 31st of December this year, under the current legislation. The minister also asked us as a commission to provide advice in two other areas at the same time. One was to take a longer term look at the international evidence about biogenic methane and methane in general and the reduction in methane emissions that would be needed in the second part of the century if we were to stabilize the contribution that methane makes to global warming at less than two degrees and closer to 1.5 degrees of warming from pre-industrial levels. The commission's advice having had international experts consider the matter was that a reduction of between 49 and 60% from 2017 levels would be required in the latter part of this century. The minister also asked us to give advice on whether in the Commission's view our current nationally determined contribution under the Paris Agreement was 
consistent with our international obligations under that agreement. The Commission concluded that our current nationally determined contribution, which was to reduce our net all gases, all greenhouse gases emissions by 2030, by 30% from our 2005 gross level of emissions, that that nationally determined contribution was not consistent with our fair share of emissions reductions required globally. And that we would need to do much more than a 36% reduction from our 2005 gross emissions to our 2030 net emissions. And the much more was a political choice determined by the fact that New Zealand is historically a high emitting country, that we are currently a reasonably high income country, that we do have known technologies to reduce emissions that we could choose to adopt. And as a consequence, we should do more than the average. But how much more is in the end a political choice. All along, New Zealand expected that it would meet its nationally determined contribution from a combination of domestic action, that is reducing gross emissions and carbon sequestration, largely from forestry, and offshore mitigation, that is paying another country that was willing and able to permanently and additionally meet more than its share of emissions reductions where such a reduction was measurable and verifiable. That will come at a cost to New Zealand. It represents a real wealth transfer, the quantum of which can only be determined in the future by the outcomes of our domestic action. And the price can only be determined in the future when we know what offsets will cost transnationally. But the Commission has estimated that depending on where our nationally determined contribution settles and how much we are prepared and able to do through domestic action, that bill for this decade could be anywhere from 2.5 billion New Zealand dollars to over 20 billion New Zealand dollars. That liability is not accounted for in the Crown's balance sheet. So the work of the Commission was to provide advice to the government on the direction of policy to get emissions reductions that would help achieve our targets. And in New Zealand, it's very clear. Agricultural emissions are half of all our greenhouse gas emissions, and we need to find ways of reducing biogenic methane from pastoral ruminant livestock. Transport is 40% of the other half of our emissions. And unless we decarbonize our transport system through mode shift, better efficiency of internal combustion engines, and low and no emission alternative transport, we will never achieve our domestic targets or international obligations. We must also decarbonize energy production while increasing the supply of renewables. And we must make sure that we decarbonize medium and low temperature heat. And my final comment is, if you think emissions reductions are going to be challenging socially, technically, and economically, then adaptation is going to prove to be even more expensive more technically demanding and more socially and politically challenging this decade. The work that needs to be done is substantial. The jobs and labor that will be required is significant. And there is no doubt there is a high cost to delay. I look forward to our discussion and your questions. Kia ora. Thank you, Rod. Um, so our second uh, speaker this afternoon is uh, Genevieve Smith.
uh, Genevieve is a principal who leads Becker's sustainability advisory team, and she has over 16 years of experience in environmental and resource management in the UK and New Zealand. And that's driven her focus on emissions management at organization and project levels. So we'll hand over to Jen. Thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa. Nice to be here with you all this evening. Um, great to hear from uh, Dr. Rod Carr on um, the trajectory for New Zealand. Um, between Kushal and myself, we'll be attempting to bring um, the kind of experience that we have uh, within the realms that we work in, in terms of some of the things that we could change on the ground to help meet New Zealand's um, national trajectory. And so there are three points that I'll be touching on today. Um, the first is the urgency of now. Um, I'll be touching briefly on technology change and data. And finally, landing on a little bit of behavioral change. So um, going back to the urgency of now, we've, we've heard from Rod that there's some ex exceptionally urgent things that we need to be doing now. And I think the most important thing is that we need to remember the urgency of avoiding generating emissions now. There's a time bound element to the situation we're in. We have a number of emissions that are locked in, so that change is coming. But also, as we've heard, the difficulty of decarbonizing some of the sectors that play an essential role in our built environment and how we operate as society um, is an essential component to think about going forward. So we need to avoid reaching some of these dangerous climate tipping points um, and delay that uh, reaching those points as, as much as we can. And so taking the decision to avoid generating emissions now is essential. And to illustrate this with an example, um, there's obviously a current debate going on within um, the infrastructure sector in particular about the use of steel versus timber, for example, in systems. And obviously there are some um, conversations going on around the end of life of some of these materials. Steel is endlessly recyclable, which is um, good for the environment. Um, timber has that carbon element sequestered in it, but um, at the moment has very linear disposal route, for example, which in, um, generates some emissions as it may have been uh, put into landfill. And the difficulty I think we have at the moment is making the decisions about how to go forward with things like structural systems and what elements we really should be choosing. I think really if we, if we focus on the emissions avoidance now, then it's important to quantify um, from a carbon perspective, we can, we're able to quantify that quite rigorously right now, those emissions that are generated from the, the production of those materials. It's more difficult to quantify end of life um, from infrastructure, for example, that's got a 50 year design life. It may well be that in the future we have excellent closed loop, <coughs> excuse me, closed, closed loop systems <coughs> that will enable us to make better choices in the future. But as it comes down to avoiding emissions now, um, we can only be presented with the information that we have in front of us. But of course, when we're thinking about avoiding emissions now, our minds turn to technology and data as well. And when and where we can rely on the use of technology and when its impact may be felt across the different sectors as we try and change our trajectory. We know that we have a lot of that expertise and the technology available today to make that shift. We obviously heard that the support for that shift and the costs involved certainly does come down um, and revolves around a political choice for support for making that shift. But there are bits and pieces of technology and data that we have available to us today to enable us to actually make better decisions now. Things like digital twins could definitely help us understand the impacts of different options or choices or enable us to model different technology situations and outcomes. Particularly in the infrastructure space, we've got the use of AI, energy management systems and BIM. All of these things really help us to integrate digitization into the kind of decisions we're making in the infrastructure world. But I often hear in the work that I do, um, the desire to gather a lot of data, lots and lots of it, report it, analyze it and continue to collect um, ever greater detail. And I guess for me, again, thinking of this urgency of now, 
we do have to ask ourselves, do when is sufficient amount of data or a reasonable level of data that we have that we can get into decision making processes quickly? It's not about endless data collection. We don't have a lot of time for that. It's about reasonable data with some confidence into decision making processes quickly. And I know that means that we might have to be more comfortable with grayness, perhaps, um, perhaps with unquantified assumptions or proxies, but relying on perfect data, um, I don't think we have sufficient time to do that. We just need to make better decisions more quickly. So at a practical level, what that looks like is bringing data forward earlier into decision-making processes. And certainly if we are to equip ourselves with the ability to make better decisions, that involves a level of competency across industry and across our sectors of understanding that language of carbon and how we bring that forward into decision-making. But of course, technology and data aren't the only things we need to affect change at a systems level. We absolutely need to bring people along for the ride with us. And to do that, we need incentives for people to change. And that's from individual level to organizational level. So the things like the electric vehicle rebates, for example, or the ECA funding we have available for decarbonization or process heat fund from government or waste minimization or even Callahan Innovation, there are a number of ways that we can incentivize people and organizations to change. But we do need some disincentives, some nudges, some barriers to be put up to also make the other choices look less attractive uh, when we're trying to raise the bar on minimum standards. So that does come into that fossil fuel based vehicle um, fee, obviously that's been in the news recently. Things like the carbon neutral government program asking us to lift the bar on the level of reporting and understanding within government. And certainly things like the MB building for climate change, looking at building codes, etc. All of these really help to lift the bar and nudge us in the right direction. But some interesting work done over in the UK um, by the Climate Change Commission there around behavioural change um, from a study that was undertaken on how uh, what the public level of awareness was around the actions that they would need to take to help the UK meet their net zero commitments. It turned out there was quite a big gap. 44% uh, of UK adults uh, didn't realise that they would perhaps have to switch to an electric vehicle or change the heating system within their house to enable the government to meet um, net zero targets. And of course, those choices that are available for to people need to be at least as good as, if not better than the existing situation, because um, we, we certainly make our decisions based on um, going from better to better. So it won't be just switching um, en masse to something worse. So that public understanding and bringing, bringing people along for the ride is essential. Um, the UK had a good model, I think, of having citizens' assemblies on climate change. That might be something that we could look at here to engage the general public and lift awareness. And finally, just a really interesting study that came out last week that I think is worth mentioning from Sweden. Um, they recently undertook a, a review of the emissions generated across the different genders. And it looks like um, men men's spending on goods causes 16% more emissions than women's, mainly due to the spending on petrol and diesel for cars, apparently, um, whereas women would spend more money on home decoration, health and clothes. Now, I appreciate that's very stereotypical analyses that have come out, but I guess in the round, what that points to is really there are many ways in which we behave as individuals and certainly taking a broad brush on how we affect change within the general population needs to perhaps be as broad as it can to make sure that we are using all the lever levers we can uh, to get to our New Zealand targets. So on that, I will hand back to Dan, thank you. Thank you, Jen, really interesting stuff. Um, so our third speaker this evening is Kushla Loom. Uh, Kushla is a technical director in Becker's planning and environments team and has over 18 years experience in environmental science and coastal planning in New Zealand and across the Pacific, uh, which is obviously uh, heavily 
uh, affected by climate change. Um, Kushler loves a, a wicked problem, uh, which has led her to focus on climate adaption as her main area of work. So Kushla, welcome and welcome to your very bright background. Uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, it's really great to be here, um, especially with these esteemed speakers that I'm appearing with. Um, I'm glad uh, Rod set the scene for my discussion around adaptation and the fact that it is a, a massively complex issue. Um, I had a go in preparing for this uh, presentation, wrote down a few uh, challenges on some post-it notes and put them behind me. So you can see that there's uh, <laughs> quite a few challenges when it comes to adaptation planning. So um, definitely uh, it's fair to say more complex issue, I think personally, than the mitigation issue that we're, we're focused on as a country. So is New Zealand doing enough in the adaptation space? Uh, well, no, I don't think we are, but I also do acknowledge that there are a number of challenges. And I also acknowledge that our government has made some recent moves to take a bit more of a, a proactive role in this space. So my chat today will focus on a few of those uh, challenges and just paint the scene and a few things that we can think about to try and um, plan for and help lift some of those challenges uh, and also I'll just touch briefly at the end about the legislation that's on its way. So yep adaptation is challenging much more challenging than mitigation I think one of the key reasons it is more challenging than mitigation is that we actually have no clear national targets for adaptation. So uh, Dr Rod Carr spoke earlier about the targets that have been set. Um, the Climate Commission and the government has, has uh, adopted those targets. We don't have anything similar in the adaptation space. We don't have a national defined outcome that we're all trying to achieve when it comes to adapting to climate change. Uh, I think uh, the National Climate Change Risk Assessment has been very clear about what is at risk and it's done a lot of work in that space and of course we are eagerly awaiting the National Adaptation Plan which uh, will follow closely to the, the Climate Change Risk Assessment and will provide us with hopefully a little bit more of a, a collective nationwide vision for climate change adaptation. However, in some of the, the discussions I've had with MFE, I don't think it's going to be the magic answer that we're all waiting for because climate change is very much felt uh, with the impacts are felt at a local level. And so I think that the, the challenge that MFE are having, having in developing the National Adaptation Plan is that uh, it will be able to provide the vision, but perhaps not the specifics that we're all eagerly waiting for. Uh, the other challenge is because it is a local issue, we do have a lot of agencies doing their own uh, climate change risk assessments at a local level. So we're getting uh, many regional councils and district councils undertaking climate change risk assessments. However, you overlay that with other key stakeholders who all have assets and things at risk like district health boards, um, Ministry of Education, developers, they're all also out there doing their independent climate change risk assessments and trying to plan for the impacts of climate change. What this results in is that we get a real patchwork of science and information. And so if one of the key messages for this group is that we need to get better at sharing our information and collaborating and planning for the impacts of climate change. Uh, if we do that, we will all move in the waka a bit faster in the same direction. Uh, existing use rights. Yes, that is a major issue for achieving good adaptive planning in New Zealand. Existing use rights are established under the Resource Management Act and they are very hard to extinguish. Um, regional councils do have the ability to extinguish existing use rights off the back of natural hazards management, uh, but it's very rarely employed. As you can imagine, uh, uh, extinguishing someone's existing use rights uh, will be a very um, unpopular decision uh, and it's basically political suicide for local government agencies who are looking to try and do adaptive planning in their regions. So it is avoided. Uh, and I think in some earlier discussions with Rod, we were we were discussing the fact that many councils around the world, in fact, or many agencies are currently um, suffering from 
liability claims uh, through the courts for either taking action or in some cases not taking action. So it does seem to be quite a difficult place to be. Uh, damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. Uh, Jen touched on behaviour changes needed for mitigation. I definitely think that that's true for adaptation as well. Existing use rights have essentially set our culture. Uh, and uh, I would add to that that um, a lot of people just aren't aware or unable to think about planning for future adaptation planning. So it's not all our behaviours that make us resistant to making the big bold decisions like potentially having to move our property to safer ground. It is actually our culture that we should be allowed to live where we live um, and that we should therefore be able to protect what's ours uh, and uh, not, not have to make drastic changes to that. So a, a perfect example of that is what's happening in the West Coast at the moment. So you've probably all been listening on the news to the, the flood damaged properties down on the West Coast. Uh, I'm interested to hear today the, the Prime Minister has been down there and has assessed the damage and there's all this discussion about how do we, how do we build back. Um, and also some of the first questions that were asked by the community of the politicians was, when are we getting some flood walls put in place? So you can sort of see that the underlying culture that we have in New Zealand is we need to be able to protect, we need to be able to live where we are. I haven't heard many discussions out of the West Coast situation on, hang on, are we actually developed in the right place? Do we need to start looking for a completely alternative place to locate these people on a more permanent basis and let's move them out of the area of risk? So yes, adaptation, it's a contentious issue. It requires bold decisions and our local government framework is not well established for that. Uh, we have a three yearly election cycle. We get um, uh, you know, politicians who are elected into their seats by their communities. They are the voice of the community. And while the community voice is saying that we should be able to live where we live and not have to move, then we won't be getting big decisions made at a local government level around uh, adaptation planning. It is a very tricky situation. Um, the successful stories we've had in New Zealand have been quite long and in-depth and quite expensive processes that have really tried to bring that community along on the journey of awareness, first of all, of what the issues are and um, discussion about appetite of risk and what the future may look like in terms of uh, potentially moving to safer ground. So an example of that, if anyone's interested, is the, the Clifton to Tayo um, strategy in the Hawke's Bay. That was one of the first projects that uh, adopted the government's guidance around planning for uncertainty using what's called the dynamic adaptive pathways planning approach. Uh, that approach on that strategy has identified a range of interim options, but eventually a long term option that sees those uh, properties at high risk actually um, getting moved out of those locations, moving those people out of those locations. So really interesting example if anyone wants to read about that. Um, there is a bit of a lack, lack of clarity around roles when it comes to adaptation planning in New Zealand as well. Uh, and this is largely established um, by the fact that we have a number of pieces of different legislation uh, that manage uh, the impacts of climate change. So we've got the new Climate Change uh, Response Act, we've got the Civil Defence Emergency Management Act, we've got the Local Government Act that has natural hazards um, provisions in it, we've got the Building Act that has provisions around building and trying to avoid building in high risk locations, and of course we've got the RMA as well. So there's a number of different pieces of legislation that all kind of address the issues, but no one piece of legislation that brings it all together and makes it really clear what the roles and responsibilities of the different parties are. Um, that means that we need really good collaboration now. Uh, and the good news is, is that there is change uh, that has been mooted by the government. So uh, recently there was a recommendation an independent panel set up by the government to review the Resource Management Act and make a number of recommendations. Uh, that panel has recommended the uh, complete repeal of the Resource Management Act and the replacement of three new pieces of legislation, which are the Natural and Built Environments Act, the Strategic Planning Act, and most importantly for this discussion, the Climate Change Adaptation and Managed Retreat Act. 
So those three pieces of legislation will aim to fix some of those issues I've, I've mentioned around the lack of clarity of roles and being clear around um, uh, bringing together all those different responsibilities when it comes to climate change uh, adaptation. Uh, funding. So this is the real cruncher. So who pays for adaptation? It's a really expensive business. Um, when we're starting to talk about uh, adaptation planning that may involve completely relocating some communities, like for example the west coast, out of the area at risk, that's a very expensive undertaking. Uh, with funding comes how do you value land? How do you place values on other um, areas of significance, for example, uh, areas of cultural significance. How do you put a value on a piece of land that has Māori connections to the land, it's got taonga, it might have a marae, it might have um, other cultural features of significance. How do you value that and how do you make the decision about what the best long-term adaptive approach is for land at risk like that? Um, there, the Climate Change Adaptation Act that's being uh, mooted by the government supposedly will address the funding issue. Um, I'm yet to see and I'm eagerly awaiting whether that will indeed address the funding issue. Um, someone's going to pay at the end of the day. And this was another point I wanted to make that to date with adaptation planning, I think we tiptoe around and try and create a situation where there are no losers. I think we're going to have to accept the fact that someone will lose with adaptation planning. It's just a matter of trying to minimize those losses and trying to make them as equitable as possible. So there's the bold challenge for us all. So summing all of that up, True adaptation, in my opinion, is accepting that there's going to be risks and moving to be more flexible in the face of this uncertainty. We need to move away from our risk-based approach that we've predominantly taken in New Zealand in the past and move more to accepting that those risks are going to be inevitable and planning for them uh, and being more flexible in our planning for them. I wanted to end this by saying New Zealand's declared a climate emergency. In regards to adaptation, the climate emergency will never end. Uh, these impacts will be around for a long time, even if we do the things that Rod and Genevieve have challenged us to do to meet the best case scenario of a 1.5 degree increase in emissions, we are still on the path to having climate change impacts. So we'll be feeling those impacts for the next thousand years or so. Uh, so our climate emergency will never be over. So I don't think that we can ever think about it in terms of having an end date. I think we just need to get on with the planning now. That's all I've got to say. Back to you, Dan. Great. Thanks, Christopher. So three really interesting uh, and different talks there from, from our speakers. And we've got some um, questions coming in. Um, so for, for the rest of the session today, we're, we're really going to have a kind of an open uh, panel um, discussion. So I'd encourage you to send some more questions in and um, let's get the most out of uh, uh, the knowledge that our speakers have got. Um, I would like to just go back to, to Rod, I guess, on, on um, some of the issues that Kushler's just raised and, and get your thoughts on uh, who pays for adaptation. Uh, yeah, I think that the, the question around Westport re, uh, rebuild or retreat, you know, can we build our way out of this? Is there a better way and, and who pays? Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? So, Dan, the role of the Climate Change Commission will be to provide a stream of advice to the government when the Ministry for the Environment publishes the draft National Adaptation Plan. So at this point, the Commission does not have views on these matters. But for the purposes of this discussion, let me draw on some personal observations. I think Kushler is quite right when she says we need to be prepared for the fact that not everybody can be made whole. There will be very real losses, not all of which we should expect to be able to be compensated for. That that will be compounded by the gradual increase in premiums and ultimately withdrawal of insurance coverage for climate related events. And with that will be with the withdrawal of access to bank finance. So 
that combination of the reality of not all losses can be compensated, some losses will lie where they fall, that reality will impact all of us at some point within the next decade. That, that secondly, and perhaps most importantly, um, New Zealand has built a lot of low-lying publicly owned infrastructure. And much of the conversation about compensation is about the compensation for private losses. The reality is that we are going to spend billions of dollars protecting or retreating and replacing public infrastructure over the decades to come. And that will include stormwater outlets, sewerage ponds, it will include public schools and hospitals, roadways and airports. So the idea that there's going to be extra money left over to make whole those who own houses at the beachfront, the riverside and the lakeshore is delusional in my view. That the precedents in New Zealand are unhelpful in managing public expectations. So the government after the Canterbury earthquakes was willing to pay over $1.5 billion to buy homes on land that was unbuildable and 6,000 of them. That that precedent is now the one that many homeowners look to after a natural disaster and anticipate that level of support is essentially an entitlement. It simply is unaffordable. They were have identified over 30 low-lying communities around New Zealand with tens of thousands of homes likely to be vulnerable to inundation in the decades to come. So I think that the starting point is to have the honest conversation that public disclosure of at-risk properties should be non-negotiable. We cannot afford to live with a buyer beware stuff it to the sucker when we know now that there are at-risk properties. So it's not just a question of waiting for the flood. The real adjustment to real estate values is very present today. Hope that's helpful, Dan. Yes, I think I'm just following on from that. You, you mentioned insurance and the banks, and, and I think you know somebody said to me a few years ago uh, around planning for the future and, and master planning that, that it will be the insurance companies that in the future that tell us where to build and where not to more than the planners. Um, so I guess the, the question is, can we rely on these sort of market forces alone to, to adapt to, to climate change and make us reduce our emissions? Was that, uh, is that Warren Fair? I don't, first, uh, I don't believe so, but I'll, I'll let my colleagues on the panel have a go. But my view is markets need mates, that we need to price emissions and we need that price to be one of the tools in the toolbox, but we cannot rely on price alone because it leads to windfall gains and unavoidable burdens, which are capricious in their impact on the most vulnerable in our society. Yeah, so perhaps I guess building on that then, um, Kushler, um, coming to you, will legislation be the, the buddy to the market? And is legislation the, the answer or part of the answer? I think, <laughs> uh, to be completely honest, I don't think legislation will be the total answer. And I feel really funny saying that, being a planner. <laughs> Um, but I do, I, I guess I've been around long enough that I've developed a healthy level of cynicism about these things. And I, I, I still feel that really tough decisions are potentially not going to be made. And I think that legislation would only be our silver bullet if it really addressed those really gnarly issues that I talked about uh, during my presentation. And I can't imagine it's going to go far enough just from how I've seen these things play out. So my firm belief is that we're gonna get more change on the ground and in our communities. And I feel that the need is to 
set up our groups, collaborate at regional levels, take the opportunities that are presented through the changing legislation, and there are some great opportunities. The shift to an outcomes-focused piece of legislation as opposed to our existing RMA, which is an effects-based piece of legislation, is a massive opportunity in the climate adaptation space. Because as you can imagine, it's very difficult to manage risk through an effects-based process because you're kind of waiting for things to happen and then you you've got to be proactive with risk and you can't do an effects-based approach to that. So we are presented now with a really great opportunity uh, through the Natural and Built Environments Act and the outcomes focus, we need to be bold and set our local targets that are very clear and set the expectations with our communities very early on what our target will be for adaptation. And in doing that, we're going to need a really good engagement piece with the communities. There's going to be an awareness raising that's needed. We're going to need to take that community and all of the key stakeholders along on that journey with us. Uh, and so that will take a bit of dedicated planning. Uh, so legislation in itself isn't the silver bullet, but I think it does present some great opportunities that we need to take and make sure that we can translate really well on the ground. So we've got a um, fairly good understanding of sort of engineering costs, engineering solutions, and, and this is one of the sort of questions that has come in. Do we have a good idea of what managed retreat would actually cost us? Um, I guess, you know, is it more cost effective? Uh, is it more socially acceptable? Uh, you know, one of the challenges around that that we face, you know, it's, it is a hard decision we're going to have to face. Do we try to build our way out of it? Is it more socially acceptable and cheaper to, to just retreat? And do we know where we've got to retreat from? Yeah, so it is complex. And so no is the answer. We don't know what it'll cost because it'll be different in each situation. And like I said, there's actually going to be some pretty fundamental issues right down to how do we put a value on the land as well, especially if it happens to be land with special significance. Um, so no is the answer. We don't know that. Um, what we do know is that there is um, a lot of key considerations that we're going to need to make, like where to where do you move to? Um, so we've already got a housing shortage in New Zealand. So, <laughs> you know, we need to be planning for where we're going to actually move to. Where is safer ground? I would argue that um, there's not much safe ground in New Zealand. There seems to be what, at least one hazard <laughs> that we're mm -hmm. subject to, be it earthquake yes. risk or, uh, you know, it might not be completely climate change related, but let's face it, we, we, we live in a pretty um, hazardous environment in New Zealand. Uh, so we are going to have to accept some level of risk. Um, what I can say to the person who's asked that question is that we've had an indication that the Climate Change Adaptation Act will provide a decision-making framework that will step you through the sort of process and set expectations around what you should be looking at, right from do we do nothing, do we do minimum, do we um, relocate. So uh, there should be some guidance coming at that national level that will help with that. Um, but I do think that uh, our economists in our community are going to have a wonderful source of income for the next wee while as we work through what the cost of all of this looks like. Economists and lawyers, I suspect. Yes. Okay, so um, sort of changing tack a little bit um, for, for Jen here uh, around changing mindsets and um, uh, how we sort of affect um, change through public uh, drivers. You know, are there some good examples um, that you can think of where public behaviour change has, has occurred that we can learn from? Um, and, and what sort of things do we need to do to sort of get over this sort of mindset that the environmentally sensitive options uh, are more expensive? And how do we turn that mindset around? Yeah, I think, I mean, the mindset shift thing is really essential. We, we've literally all just lived through a systemic mindset shift in the last year. You know, the unfortunate situation that we've found with the global pandemic has forced us to change our mindset about how we work, how we travel. And a lot of that will be enduring as we go forward. We have had a fundamental change in, in society in, in a year. And I think there's a lot of stuff, and obviously we certainly want, wouldn't want to repeat that situation again. We had to 
um, halt a lot of um, normal society to kind of get that change happening. Certainly wouldn't want to see that. But in terms of the learnings from last year, um, for me, I mean, personally reflecting on that, it was, it was simple things. I think, you know, the response that we saw from New Zealand was that we had a simple task ahead of us. We had a simple message. We had simple actions that we had to take. And I guess if we parallel that to what is arguably a perhaps more complicated situation, I think we need to find ways to make it simple, to make it easy. And we need to kind of give, you know, a good examples of how that can be done to lead to that future that we want. And it's all around storytelling for me at the end of the day. Um, people respond to stories. We need to bring forward examples. We need to make it, um, I guess, a positive experience of making that change. And certainly alongside that mindset shift I, I mentioned in my discussion, that kind of incentives piece plus that kind of nudge and barriers piece, I think they're essential for helping to see how that mindset can change and actually take that um, behavioural change with it. Yeah, I think it's, it's helping people to move from this is going to be more expensive or more difficult and, and it's, it's easier to go for the non-green option um, and, and shifting that mindset. So I guess following on from that, what do you see as the, the kind of role of business in, in sort of affecting change? Uh, we've yeah, talked a little bit about the kind of markets, but um, what can businesses do? Yeah, business. I think businesses are critical. I mean, at the end of the day, um, you know, we are still people, we come from our home lives, we go to work, we go back to our lives, it, we are still the same people. And I think it's really important that business recognises that we have a role to play in that mindset shift within the culture of organisations as well. So um, the everyday work that we do within our organisations, we're able to build on that mindset shift and that cultural shift and that kind of level of competency almost about understanding about this big issue that hopefully then we can take back into private lives as well and get a bit of a shift happening from a business-led approach. But I also think, um, you know, people respond to strong leadership. And I think we've got some excellent companies around the world, in particular New Zealand, who are showing and demonstrating strong leadership in this space that show that it's possible to change, it's possible to shift, it's possible that, um, you know, you know, things like the Sustainable Business Council, for example, bringing together like-minded organisations, partnerships, collaboration, breaking down some silos, showing that we don't always have to be in competition with each other to take these quite bold steps forward. I think we need to see a lot more of that, and I, that's essential role for business in my eyes. Uh, and are we doing enough at, a, at an education level at getting in, getting in early, you know, to the, the primary school kids and, and above to try to affect change through the um, nagging three-year-old factor? I can imagine that that's certainly happening. I mean, um, we saw with the school strikes, for example, how many people that touched um, with a level of awareness and engagement that was unprecedented. Um, so I certainly feel like there is a groundswell at that level that's, that's coming through. I know our universities certainly are, are putting out more graduates with more courses and, and experience and knowledge that's certainly relevant to this sector. Um, I think there's always more that we can do. I think the biggest piece for me is probably education and business collaboration a bit more. We perhaps need to knit that together a bit more strongly going forward so that we are, um, we are preparing people for the changes ahead and working in those environments. Right, thanks. Um, just coming back to, to you, Kushla, I've got a, a question on, on the uh, legislation here. Uh, it says, uh, information needs to be available to, pen, to potential house and land developers so that they don't add to the current problem. So will the proposed legislative change require all councils to provide this information? Uh, well, I, I don't know, but what I can say is that that's currently available through... Um, the existing legislation because of course there's the land inf information memorandums on each property which provide information on known hazards that the property is, is subject to so um, potential house buyers have access to that 
information that the council holds already through that process. Um, the other way that it's currently done, obviously, is also through um, overlays on planning maps showing where non um, areas of natural hazard are. Um, the problem with that is that that's the known hazard areas as we know them now. And in, in the case of flooding, we are a bit more advanced in that in terms of factoring in the potential future flood effects when you layer on climate change to that. Um, and of course, we, we also do that in regards to sea level rise. Um, so the issue there though, is that it is a very difficult process to go through um, in a plan change process to get those lines on the maps. Um, it's not easy, as you can imagine, um, having homeowners uh, suddenly faced with their, their property being defined as a hazard zone, um, straight away uh, will potentially devalue their land. And so it is a very controversial thing to do. Um, so plan changes to put that kind of information into legislative documents uh, is usually quite lengthy and usually quite costly um, for councils. But, but it, it, there is mechanisms in place now for that to happen. Um, through the new legislation, uh, the Strategic Planning Act will require the production of regional spatial strategies and, and I personally am quite excited about this because having a future spatial plan that actually lays out where your growth is going to be um, concentrated, where your key infrastructure is going to be provided, where your future linkages are um, is actually quite an exciting tool to be able to have a conversation with your communities around this is our expectations of where we're going to be in the future so that you can raise the awareness around, you know, if you buy in this area, be aware that this is actually identified as a future area where it may need to be, um, you know, the properties may need to be relocated or infrastructure is going to be relocated at the end of its its life, you know, when it comes to be renewed, it's potentially going to shift it. So I do think that um, the legislation does present us with more opportunities that, than we have presently um, to be able to really demonstrate to um, those parties. I think you mentioned potential home owners and land developers, um, you know, areas that they might want to avoid and so that we're not actually adding to the existing issues we've got at the moment. Hmm. Um, I'll just come back to, to Rod. Um, Jen sort of touched on COVID-19 and the uh, fact that our world has been turned on its head somewhat over the last uh, year and a half, two years, and and there's kind of a, uh, an immediate impact on on people's travel and uh, long haul travel in particular. How did the commission sort of take into account what the kind of bounce back from COVID may be when you're sort of looking at trajectories and setting setting targets? And it's a really tough thing to to try and build into future projections. So interested to to know, mm. know how you tackled that. <laughs> yeah, so look, the first thing, yeah, the first thing to do is, is recognize that there is, there's bounds of uncertainty around any of these projections and, and un, undue expectations about precision uh, can make anybody's work look a bit ridiculous. So the starting point is to remind ourselves that in, in 2020, when the world was in lockdown, people were at home or working from home and, and the airlines were grounded, um, global emissions reduced by about 8%. And it gives you some idea of the extraordinary way in which fossil fuel is used in our society and is ubiquitous throughout so much of how we have built our civilization. But you can essentially remove the observable use and you've still got 92% of the emissions going on unabated. So... The commission was mindful of the likelihood that as economies reopened, uh, they would go back to the known and established ways in which societies were creating greenhouse gas emissions, and that we could reasonably then put in place technologies and behavior change pricing and regulation that would move us from that rebounded level towards the budgets uh, through the plan. So we weren't banking on any permanent sustained reduction as a result of the 2020 lockdown. And of course, international air travel is not actually included in New Zealand's emissions budgets at this point. So uh, about 4% of global emissions come from air transport, but it is one of the most rapidly growing or was until COVID sources of emissions. So 
re-establishing the baseline and doing the forecasting was made somewhat more difficult in the nearest term by COVID, but given forecast out to 2030, 2035 and out to 2050, it really is about behavior change and technology uptake, uh, the market forces that are allowed to play out and the regulatory environment uh, that may constrain choices that otherwise would have been made. The, the, the COVID challenge on behavior though is a very two-edged sword to interpret. On the one hand, um, as Jen has said, you know, there is some hope in seeing how we were able to be galvanized into collective action uh, and as a consequence achieve outcomes that might have been unimaginable in terms of the technology to develop a vaccine and the speed with which it was rolled out, in terms of the willingness of societies to give up individual rights, at least for a period in favor of the collective good. But there's also a slightly depressing part of it when you watch the public reaction in Sydney uh, as if protesting against the virus is gonna make the virus go away. We know what the public health measures are to buy us the time to vaccinate a population. And protesting against the virus is a bit pointless. In the same way, protesting against the need to reduce emissions is a bit pointless. We need to get on and do it. Our energy should be in how do we get this done as fast as possible, as fairly as possible, not how do we postpone it or put the burden on someone else. I guess following on from that, we've got a, a question around the sort of impact of uh, zero target changes on uh, employability and and um, how do you see, uh, uh, is there a net gain, a net uh, loss of, of jobs as, as we change technologies? Is, is it just one part of a, an ever moving feast with other changes to technology and things? Um, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the, the forecasting work that the commission has done and the modeling which we've done, which again, can be made to look ridiculous because it implies a degree of certainty that we all do know does not exist, identifies some areas of the economy that will need fewer jobs, such as the exploration, extraction and processing of fossil fuels to be combusted in the open environment is likely to have fewer jobs in the future. There are likely to be more jobs in the generation and maintenance of renewable energy sources than we have currently. There are likely to be fewer jobs in high emitting activities and more jobs in low or no emission activities. But exactly how that plays out regionally and nationally, how that plays out across different skill sets and age groups and ethnic groups is much harder to be precise about. But it won't come as any surprise to know that the most vulnerable will be those who have the least level of skills and training those who are essentially trapped in communities which have few alternatives to high emitting activities today. And those are the more vulnerable communities that should get the greatest level of public support to either reskill, retrain or relocate. Fantastic. Um, very uh, conscious of, of time for everybody. We, we've sort of come to the end of our uh, sort of planned hour. Um, just um, closing thoughts, Kushler, would you, have we got a, just a couple of uh, key messages to, to leave people with? Yeah, my, my key message, I guess, would be um, similar to Jen's and Rod's, which is we need to act now. Um, so I know I've mooted legislation that's coming, but let's not wait for it. Um, the Climate Change Adaptation Act is on the slower path um, to the other 
two pieces of legislation, which is disappointing given it's legislation that I think we needed at least 10 years ago. Uh, so don't wait for it. Instead, just try and factor into all of your decisions that you're making now um, a climate change consideration. Make sure that you're not making inflexible decisions which are going to lock you into a long term issue. So um, really start thinking now about um, will this Will this option be the best option in the face of a potential future climate uh, impact? So that's my parting comment. Hmm. Very good. Um, Jen, any parting thoughts from, from you on uh, emissions, behavioural change, how we can influence that? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, Kush, this is a great point. I've got to act now. I think the biggest thing for me, uh, obviously coming from kind of professional services and engineering background is... Um, we just can't forget the people. It's great that we have thinking about technology and we're thinking about how we can change things when we're building things or designing things. I think it's equally as important that we bring people along for the ride, be that our communities, be, our, be that our colleagues, be that our families. I think it's really important that we bring the people element into this whole shift. Otherwise, the two things will be completely out of sync and, and will um, in dangerous of actually meeting these targets. So we need the team of five million to all row in the same direction. Yes. And finally, Rod, I'll uh, give you the honour of closing us out with your uh, your pearl of wisdom for us all to take away. I, I think the reminder is that no emissions reduction is too small and no emissions reduction is too soon that the planet doesn't distinguish between a ton of emissions in New Zealand or a ton in China, and that all emissions need to be reduced, and all emissions count, and sooner we reduce them, the better prepared we will be for a greener, healthier, low emissions, more sustainable society. It is in New Zealand's self-interest to reduce our emissions by as much as possible as soon as possible. And the commission's report entitled Anaya Tonune, Now is the Time, should be the theme everybody takes away. Don't wait for others. Don't blame others. If you're in a position to reduce barriers that stop others from making good choices, or if you're in a position to promote enablers that will help with better choices, now is the time to act. Fantastic. And I think as, as industry professionals, we, we do have uh, a, a duty, a responsibility, uh, and a, an ethical need to do everything that we can to influence behaviours and, and make the right decisions in, in the work that we do uh, for our communities and, and to make sure that people have the, the right information in front of them. So on that note, I'd like to really thank the, the three of you. It's been a, a fantastic session, really interesting. And we've had some great um, questions. Uh, I hope it's been really informative for everybody. Um, thank you, Rob. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Kushla, very much. Um, thank you, everyone who's attended this evening. I hope you've enjoyed it and hope you've got a lot out of it. And as I said, our, our next webinar on the 24th of August is about the future of New Zealand small drinking water supplies, which is another gnarly subject that I'm looking forward to some really good um, uh, talks and debate on. So with that, thank you very much, everybody. We'll, we'll call this evening to a close. Thank you.